Okay, great. We're ready. Okay, thank you. Uh, well, thank you. Yeah, thank you for for you know the opportunity to present and and I just would like to start apologizing for not being there. I think we're like we're all kind of done with Zooms and all that. Uh, unfortunately, it, I couldn't make it work. I would have loved to be there, so I apologize for uh, having to do this remotely. Um, so. Yeah, I just wanted to, uh, you know, also uh, mention that um, I guess this talk is going to be a little different uh, for mainly two reasons. Uh, the first one, I'm not a user yet, even though I'm uh, I'm working towards that. We're, we're trying to uh, develop some proposals and hopefully uh, become a user very soon. Uh, that's one thing. The other thing is that we don't really use microscopic tools. Uh, however, we do look at my microscope microbial processes, right? And and some of the, the idea of our tools is that we'll be able to actually track down some of these processes. Uh, but again, the tools itself are not, you know, uh, really microscopic. Anyway, with that said, um, yeah, so what we do, uh, we apply the tools we apply, it's what you can call near surface geophysics. So that's, uh, these are tools we can use to look at the shallow region of the earth, what, you know, uh, these days, a lot of people call it critical zone, which is this like upper hundreds meters, something around that. Probably with geophysics, probably a little less than that. But regardless, they're like a set of like non-invasive uh, measurements, and what we're looking at is that actually uh, variations in physical properties of of materials, right? So it's 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 an indirect method. So we can see this image here. That's ground penetrating radar. So you're looking at how this electromagnetic wave travels through the subsurface we're able, able to infer the, the physical property, which is dielectric permittivity, relative dielectric permittivity for different layers. Then we need to use a petrophysical model to convert this physical property into something more uh, meaningful. Um, so uh, in this case will be maybe uh, moisture content, porosity, or uh, you know whatever that might be, depending on the method. Uh, the point is that the, the, the array of measurements involves a set of like complex interactions between uh, you know different uh, processes hydrology soil soil chemistry biology all these different things so then it requires kind of a multidisciplinary approach um, and that's kind of the exciting part of this now there is a just to kind of very quick show uh, this is a classic paper 40 years ago uh, there was this paper they were basically showing how uh, a contaminant plume uh, was detected, uh, was undetected, first of all, with a set of like actually hydrological wells that are shown in black here. Uh, and then the contrast with uh, this terrain conductivity electromagnetic survey um, that was able actually to identify this contaminant plume. So again, it almost made, seems to you know be made in, in purpose, you know, that the, the wells completely missed that contaminant plume, right? But it kind of gives a good, uh, you know, example of kind of the idea of what near surface geophysics should be, uh, and especially for, you know, a lot of the talks here, uh, which is more like a, a way to guide sampling, uh, both in space and time, that then we can actually use these tools for, for that, right? So kind of being able to constrain where it makes more sense to, you know, maybe sample or conduct, you know, more uh, uh, high, higher resolution measurements. Um, Okay, so then from near surface geophysics, a couple of decades ago, uh, biogeophysics was developed or you know uh, evolved. It was kind of more of an offshoot of hydrogeophysics uh, with the focus on microbial processes. So there is a, a, a wide array of papers and we are getting into too much detail, but just to show a couple of figures here, uh, things like looking at bioremediation, that's like a, a, a set of like ground penetrating radar measurements showing uh, a contaminated site like a leachate plume, and how the signal gets attenuated, and then you know the effects after five years of bioremediation, and then you can see how these reflectors are coming back. Uh, so it's almost a way to uh, track down how well bioremediation is doing. Uh, there is other you know papers looking at things like you know how uh, injection of uh, acetate might actually induce uh, uh, formation of these iron reducing bacteria. In this case, it was a site that was contaminated by uranium. So they were again uh, developing these time lapse measurements and looking how this injection of acetate helps, you know, evolving these uh, bacteria that then might help on that uh, bioremediation. 
Again, in our case, we use a lot of these biogeophysics approaches uh, in peat soils. Um, and we've been using this over the years in many different ways. Uh, again, this is a kind of a bit dense, like the, this like slice, uh, the slide here. Uh, but again, I just want to give a quick overview of some of the things over the years that we've been doing in relation to peat soils, uh, starting with something as kind of simple as like just looking strictly at subsurface architecture. Uh, again, we're looking at scales of like, you know, several meters down, looking at, you know, methods, whether it's like electrical resistivity tomography, like the image on top or GPR, things that might be more like a two dimensional profiles can also be turned into three dimensional profiles, like the image here below, where you can actually see uh, the thickness in, in three dimensions, in this, in this case, a, a depression or wetland in Florida. You can then upscale the center image here uh, using other methods that's uh, actually uh, airborne uh, electromagnetics. Uh, in this case, it was like looking at uh, large distribution of pit thickness on these like uh, pitlands in uh, Indonesia in this case, or you can even like break things down even in terms of like different layers that then might help you like that would be the image here on the right, uh, how different uh, layers might, uh, might, you might be able to constrain the amount of carbon for this like specific layer. And then by, by being able to measure volume, then you can retrieve a more uh, uh, higher resolution value in terms of like uh, total carbon content, right? So it's like we're refining uh, those carbon stocks measurements. Um, and then one of our main interests also that uh, was related to biogenic gases. So again, looking at biogenic gas distribution, right? So uh, again, fairly large scales in this case, with the image here on the left, looking at uh, which areas might have like a larger amount of gas content being developing uh, or being accumulated below the ground. Uh, that will be again a, a two dimensional image or then again like looking more into 3D images that will be the image on the right here. Uh, and in this case it's also uh, a ground planetary radar but it's actually looking at changes in amplitude of the signal and then relating these changes in amplitude in, in areas that might have an increased gas content. So then uh, we're looking at here actually at time slices. So it would be like, like cutting a, a slice across these cubes. And then you can see for the two different moments in time, how these areas with low amplitude, the yellows here that will be representing increased gas air, or, or areas with supposedly more gas content, how these might be evolving over time, right? So then again, the idea is like, well, can we then uh, use these to, you know, uh, more precisely conduct our sampling, if, if that's what, you know, if, if uh, we're trying to maybe, you know, sample uh, some of those gases. Uh, we can also then get into expanding these time-lapse measurements and like look at um, uh, things like, um, again, how we can infer, um, and again, like this perhaps are kind of like busy. Uh, you can just like ignore everything but the actually circles which represent gas content, right? So that would be gas content over time. So again, the idea is like you can see how gas content within the soil is, you know, shows this period of actually decreases that then we can relate that to periods of emissions of gases to the atmosphere or vertical migration, and then periods of gas increasing in the soil that will be related to actually production. So then these percents of gas, once we extract some of this gas measure, uh, methane CO2 composition, we can then, you know, uh, extrapolate and, and, and convert this percent into an actual flux value uh, that will be typically milligrams of methane per square meter per day. So then we can get actually rates of emission and rates of production. Uh, again, we've done this in either tropical soils like or subtropical like the Everglades, but also like northern systems like in Maine. Uh, this was interesting just to kind of highlight that uh, it was showing the buildup of gas content over the winter. And then as soon as the spring melt happened, you had this sudden release. So it's almost like the snow was causing, creating this barrier that as soon as it was gone, it caused this like very large release. Then again, based then on the carbon content, or on the on the percent uh, of carbon loss, then we can infer like an actually a proper uh, mass of methane uh, being lost. Okay, and then um, I've been talking a, a, a real bit, or, or a lot of the things I'll be showing or that I'm showing relate to ground penetrating and radar. So without getting too much into the actual, uh, uh, you know, details of the method, 
I just want to very simply show what the idea is, right? So um, again, the idea of the ground planetary and radar is like you have a transmitter antenna that shoots this electromagnetic wave signal. This signal bounces at certain interfaces and then returns to a receiver, right? Now, these bouncings usually will be whenever you have a strong change in density, right? So we can kind of simplify this. Let's pretend we have a water pit interface and then a pit clay interface, right? So each one of these bouncings, when you look at the trace uh, and express as a two-way travel time, whenever your wave gets back to the receiver, that will result in a change in amplitude, right? So the signal is getting back to that receiver. So that will give us this increase in amplitude, right? This little wiggle here. That will be the same for that interface pit clay, right? So we have like for this simple model, we have like these, you know, uh, uh, you know, two uh, interfaces that we can identify. Now, if we having a saturated soil, uh, you will, might have changes in that um, uh, pit material, mainly in forming gas, right? So if you have like this material fully saturated. Really, anything changing in, in changing in that soil is going to be actually gas forming and gas moving, right? So then, that's where we can take advantage of the method because the it's very sensitive to actually changes in gas content because gas is the uh, so the wave is going to go the fastest in air and the slowest in water. So you, if you have a pore space where you have actually gas being formed and replacing that water, then that signal is going to accelerate, uh, and then if that gas that bubble is lost and then water replaces that, then the signal is gonna uh, slow down. So then the result is then, obviously as we build gas in this soil, this interface is gonna be pulled up. Obviously not that the interface has physically moved, but obviously the travel time to that interface has become faster because now we have a lot of gas. So then it is with this change in travel time that then we can actually infer a change in velocity having velocity, then we can infer like what I was saying earlier, relative electric permittivity. Uh, and then we can apply our petrophysical model, in this case, what we call complex refracted index model, which again, without getting into the details, we'll be able to basically express this permittivity uh, as a gas content. And that's basically how we uh, use the method. Now we use this method in conjunction with a lot of different methods. Obviously we need to constrain uh, the GPR is an indirect method. So we need, and again, without getting into the details, but we have a pretty wide array of like methods that we use at different scales of measurement, also temporal scales, uh, things like gas traps to actually directly uh, collect some of these gas that then we can actually measure with gas chromatography for composition of methane and carbon and, and CO2. Um, and things like that. Um, also, uh, uh, the matrix properties are very important, physical properties, right? So things like uh, porosity, hydraulic conductivity, uh, we're very interested in understanding how changes in those might be affecting the, the spatial and temporal distribution of these gases. So that's one of the ways that actually we've been trying to uh, work with uh, you guys at uh, PNNL and uh, in this case with uh, uh, Tamas Varga um, in basically incorporating X-ray uh, computed tomography measurements and then being able to look at how different pit soils made out of different, obviously, uh, plant compositions will, you know, change in terms of like physical properties and then how that might be affecting that spatial distribution of gas. Um, Again, so I'll just go show very quickly a couple uh, examples, uh, but the idea is this, right? Like looking at gas, uh, we're basically interested in um, uh, understanding what is the spatial and then temporal distribution of these actual bubbles below the ground, right? Now there is different scales that we can use and then different scales where I'm getting into the details, but over the years, you see a lot of different conceptual models on how actually these bubbles might be uh, accumulating and whether it's more related to, you know, uh, changes in porosity at, uh, at the microscopic scale, or even like, you know, uh, when you go to larger scales where they might be, like I was mentioning earlier with snow, where there might be some sort of confining layers that might be actually causing also some of these uh, volumes of gas to accumulate larger. And then once you have a bridge, then all of a sudden you have this release. Um, so that's basically the idea. So then we, we do these at different, uh, scales, um, and then just looking at, you know, uh, starting with laboratory uh, scales, which would be more like centimeter to millimeter uh, scales or, 
uh, decimeters. Uh, again, that's a typical setup. So we'll have our, our samples here. Uh, here. Xavier, can you hear us? Hold on, you're muted. Oh, sorry, I don't know. Can you hear me now? Uh, yeah, we can. And uh, can you go back, uh, reshare your slides? Maybe the last minute we did not hear. I see. Yeah. Um, um, can, you, you can hear me. You can see the screen, right? Uh, we can hear you. Hold on. Cannot see the screen quite yet. Um, yeah, sorry, that's the issue with uh, <laughs> Zoom. Um, but yeah, no, hold on just a second. Oh, I think it's just on uh, my there. Sheet. We go, perfect. Okay. Yeah, okay. okay, yeah, I apologize. Yeah, sorry, no, what happened there? Uh, yeah, I'll, I'll go quickly because, um, yeah, I'm, I'm running out of time here. Uh, but again, I just wanted to show some of these, um, you know, different scales of measurement that were, were mainly converting this, uh, you know, GPR measurements into an actual gas content within the soil. And that's kind of one of the unique aspects of this, right? We can look at the gas distribution of the soil non-invasively, right? Um, so again, this will be more like for a, for a laboratory scale that I was showing where we can see here, uh, you know, this gas content, how it builds up over time as the gas keeps accumulating and then it kind of stabilizes and, and starts like changing over time. Uh, and then as, as time goes by, and then again, we constrain these with direct measurements on gas traps where we can actually see fluxes and measure proper fluxes of, uh, uh, you know, of this methane and CO2. Um, but again, we can then e extrapolate this into the field, same idea. So then we have here, you know, like a, a, a long transect or like a, a nine, 10 meter transect where we can actually look over time and how gas is building up and releasing. Uh, and that again, looking at, you know, just the, the color image here, we can actually then be able to uh, infer hotspots for uh, gas accumulation and gas release, right? So again, this is an example just for three uh, single days, but then we can see here, you know, that percent of change in this case, like uh, gas that we assume was released from 16 to 24, then we can again, convert that uh, into a proper uh, methane flux, right? Same idea for the buildup. So then we're inferring then uh, actually not release, but, you know, build up or what we can probably say production. Now we're taking this one, uh, you know, a step up in terms of like scale of measurement. And we're now like, uh, developing these ground penetrating radar drone-based measurements. So again, the idea is to expand this scale. Um, so really quick, they're just like, again, very preliminary. We're still conducting this. So we don't have a time-lapse series yet, but uh, what we have here is just like these two grids uh, for these two uh, sites in the Everglades. And again, it's just like 
uh, discrete gas content, right? So it's gas content at that particular day. Uh, but again, it, it shows nicely how, you know, a variable, the accumulation of this gas content might be, uh, you know, at a scale that is much larger than, that, that we can actually uh, perform at the lab or, you know, using the traditional ground-based measurements. Um, I'm going to skip this. Uh, I just wanted to say that there is other things that we do, um, you know, um, that might imply even things like, you know, uh, looking at moisture content in trees. Again, I think the exciting part of geophysics is that the applications are unlimited, right? So it's it's just a matter of like figuring out, uh, you know, what kind of, you know, how how can, you know, geophysics assist you or whatever it is that, that you might need, right? It's particular in terms of sampling. So again, the idea here is just like looking at actually moisture content distribution along that tree trunk um, that seems to be showing and there's a tomographic image and it kind of shows nicely this distribution of a, a sapwood versus hardwood. Uh, and that's just showing a, a quick graph on, on you know, uh, different trees and how the distribution of moisture content might be actually be different. Again, this is very new. So we're still like working on properly converting uh, that velocity into moisture content that we'll be using, you know, the right petrophysical model. Anyway, with all these, I just want to uh, conclude uh, just saying that, you know, uh, these methods, uh, they're, they're powerful tools for particularly non-invasively uh, investigating some of these microbial processes. They're also pretty cost effective. Uh, I showed a bunch of applications focusing on biogenic gases um, uh, where you can look at things in pretty high spatial resolution and different scales of measurements and also a variety of, of environments. Again, we've done work from the tropics to the Arctic. So, uh, it, you know, it's uh, uh, application in that sense is, is very wide as well. Uh, also, the, the, the exciting part is that being indirect methods, then you need to constrain these measurements. So that makes the approach very multidisciplinary. And that's where we need help from, you know, a lot of other people uh, to constrain our measurements. Um, and I guess that the, the, the final uh, take home message is that, you know, the idea, and again, in relation to a lot of the work that you guys do, uh, is actually how the methods can actually be used to, to guide by geochemical sampling, uh, both in space and time, right? And that's um, a little bit kind of the message, right? A lot of these methods can be very, very helpful for that, uh, rather than going, you know, blind when you do sampling uh, and trying to just capture, you know, uh, a lot of different um, uh, locations without really, uh, you know, having a sense of what might be, might make more sense, right, basically. Anyway, this is all done through the help of a lot of people, so I won't read all this, but just to leave that slide in there and mention uh, uh, some of the collaborators related to uh, that involved in this work. Uh, obviously, all my students at the, the Environmental Geophysics Lab at FAU, uh, and of course, funding agencies uh, that have been uh, critical for uh, all this work. And with all that, I'll stop there, and I apologize. I think I went over a couple of minutes, so... Uh, uh, yeah, uh, I think I'll ha be happy to take any questions if we have any time. So thank you. All right, I think we have time for one question. Yes, Ken. Thanks for a very interesting talk. Um, I noticed at one point you, you talked about the gas and you labeled it as methane. Um, there's also the potential for it being CO2. Are there any contrast mechanisms that you're aware of that you can use to distinguish between CO2 and methane or the relative ratio of those two within your gas bubbles measurements? Um, yeah, I mean, not from the geophysics standpoint, right? So uh, what we're able to identify is a free phase gas. That, that's all we can see. Then yeah, we collect or, or, or bubbles and then we take them to the lab. And actually, again, I'm, I'm not a chemist by any means. So, so I have what, what I call like a, a GC for dummies. So it basically only measures carbon uh, a, a species. So we're basically able to identify both CO2 and methane. Uh, but yeah, from that, that's how we can break it down. So we do have estimates also for CO2 even though a lot of the time, especially down here in the Everglades, um, the amount of CO2 is much, much smaller compared to the, to the methane. So 
we tend to, I don't know, and this is also really a, a, a more of an interesting methane. So a lot of the things that I showed was put in terms of methane, uh, but yeah, we can definitely um, put things in terms of CO2 as well, uh, but not, again, not from the, the geophysics standpoint, right? So what, what, what we can see there is whether gas has been replaced by air or, or whether, you know, air has been replaced by water. Um, so then, you know, we can, uh, yeah, extract or, or use that to kind of do or something at that location, if that makes sense. Yes, thank you. All right.